we talked about 5-HT3 receptors and the acute, it's, they're very effective in the acute, but not as effective in the delayed. And we've learned from pathophysiology over time that the NK1 receptors are more important in, uh, in that area. So uh, Beth, can you talk a little bit about our approaches to NK1 antagonists and what we have available? All right, I think so. Adding these to 5-HT3s has also dramatically improved, I think, our control in the delayed setting. Not that we're doing 100%, but um, I think the addition of these drugs and the way that we understand substance P binding with NK1 may be giving a longer binding so that we're um, controlling the delayed setting of nausea vomiting better with these drugs. So um, there are several drugs now in this category. Um, so oral aprepitant was the first one that was approved. Um, and then fosaprepitant, which is the IV form of aprepitant, was approved uh, later on. Um, now we have relopitant as well, which is, has a much longer half-life. Um, so that can be dosed on day one and you know, have coverage um, up to seven days or even longer, technically. Um, so I think the addition of these drugs has really um, been a benefit to us. There's also nitupitin, which is part of a, an NK1 that's part of a combination pill that we'll talk about as well. Um, so there's actually technically four drugs now that are in this category. So how has that changed things, and wh where are you using NK1 receptor? Yeah, so that is built in absolutely to our highly emetogenic regimens, and then it's an option for our moderately emetogenic regimens. Now, if you look at the NCCN guidelines, it's absolutely approved for both moderately and highly emetogenic, um, really all of these drugs in, in this category. So some practices will say, well, I'm going to make a call on it on the moderately emetogenic regimen based on patient risk factors. Some practices will automatically put it into every single regimen. So I think that really depends on your practice um, and your patient population. So I could say at our institution, um, we're very much tasked right now with cost and savings of cost. The NK1s, I think, are, are under, they're still underutilized, especially in the MEC setting. And what I found really refreshing is that the, the guidelines are now like laid it out there that it's definitely an option, you know, and I'm hoping that that makes the payers follow suit so that we are able to maybe give these drugs because, you know, we're always told use the best drugs that we have up front to prevent, 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 but we're still not really able to facilitate doing that in all of our patient population. So hearkening back to the beginning of our discussion today, we have guidelines, they're very specific and clear who should get triplet therapy, HEC patients now, carbo patients have moved up there, AC patients, platinum at the least, and we still have this range of MEC where it's totally acceptable to give it and we're all using patient risk factors. But it's so fascinating that despite the fact we have guidelines, if you look at usage and surveys, there's still a significant percentage of patients even with HEC who aren't getting an NK1 yep. antagonist. And do people have thoughts on why that is? Is that related to cost, not thinking about it? What, what are your feelings? They must not have an EMR. <laughs> they must not have an EMR. <laughs> that and, you know, uh, I mean, I don't want to um, harp on the community ones, but they may not have, you know, as much um, multi multidisciplinary approaches to the way they treat care, so they may not have, you know, those extra people. You know, like, I know sometimes I'm considered a, an a wife in their ear, you know, saying, hey, don't forget this, don't forget this, you know, but it's that, it's that extra reinforcement and making sure that we're following guideline-based therapy. Yeah, I'd be interesting to see, uh, interested to see who is not using. Is it segregated by small community practice versus institutional practice? Um, my guess is, in some ways it is. As you suggest, there's not somebody there to, you know, to say, hey, build this into your standard treatments. And if it's not built in, it becomes an afterthought. And um, if, if you bring it up to that physician, of course they'll add it. But why weren't they using it up front? There's probably something which was never put in place. And this has been years and years and years now. This is not new. But nobody really stepped up and said, hey, put this in place to start, and your patients will do well. Let's talk about the uh, route of administration of the NK1. So. Um, we talked about the fact that the first drug approved um, was a prepotent and that 
the oral preparatin had to be given in three with a loading dose and then two additional days, which was difficult. Then we had IV. Now we have the newer drugs, rolopatin, which is uh, oral currently and an IV form is coming. So let's talk about, uh, first of all, efficacy. So what, what's your experience with efficacy in terms of uh, oral rolopatin versus other agents and particularly IV? Uh, so I have very limited use with oral rolopatin, but I've had some. Um, I think that I don't think the efficacy is that big of a difference. I think that they're efficacious, efficacious whether you give them oral or IV. I think the route of administration is the issue as far as an oral is a prescription that the patient has to get and grapple with a prior authorization or a copay. Now that being said, um, the fosaprepitin, which is IV, um, lately we've been having to prior off that as well as part of our chemotherapy regimen. Um, so that, we actually have to prior off um, fosaprepitin and palinocitron with several of our managed care patients. So it's- Even on guideline. Even on guideline, absolutely on guideline. So when we pre-start our chemotherapy, we're now being asked, what is your anti-emetic regimen? Make sure you add that if you're, if you're planning to use palinocitron or fosaprepitin as part of their IV. Now if it's oral, it's gonna come back to my office, but we have a chemotherapy pre-start person um, who's doing that and they are asking us to make sure if you're going to include those two drugs we have to prior off them for some of the insurances not all but some um, but the upside of the orals actually for us has been the fact that we don't have to waste chair time in order for them to get an IV and it's not just chair time it's pharmacy mixing time um, it's prior authorization time so the ability of them to take a pill while they're waiting in my waiting room and go back and just get their chemotherapy and go home has actually been something that's been nice for us and it's been a benefit. So if you have a relationship with a pharmacy, especially an in-house pharmacy that can dispense, or if you yourself are a dispensing pharmacy, I think there is an upside to the orals uh, based on that. Um, so there's, I think there's pros and cons of that route of administration. I think from an efficacy standpoint, I can tell you the first time I gave an oral um, and then cisplatin, and there was nothing going through their IV. I was like, oh, please absorb and work, please. Yeah. And the patients would come back, you know, three weeks later and say, yeah, it was great. I had no nausea. I'm like, okay, it works. Um, and, and obviously there's clinical trial data to say that, but it's just, for me, just I've been so used response. to my whole career using <laughs> IVs. Um, even when oral a prepotent was out, at least they still had the IV 5-HT3. You know, now if you're using an all oral regimen, it, initially it was just, I had to get used to it. With my friend, especially the cisplatin patients, I was like, oh. Yeah, old habits die oh, hard. Oh man! But <laughs> you're also giving a pill for advanced lung cancer in certain instances, right, and right. it works really well. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> things are changing. <laughs> so, but I agree with you. It is you have that moment of am I doing the right thing? Boy, did but, I have a moment. <laughs> but um, you know, in the relapidin studies that we did, it worked really wonderfully uh, in AC patients and in platinum patients in both HEC and what we called MEC then and is now now HEC. So very comfortable with that. But we are, this changing reimbursement strategies, you bring up this whole issue for some patients uh, from a reimbursement and from the practice burden on prior auths, it might be better to do IV and some it may interestingly be better to do orals. So we've talked a lot about the NK1s and the orals. How will we use IV relopatin, which is imminent in being approved and where do you see the value is of uh, that particular agent? It can be stored at room temperature, which makes it easy for the pharmacist. Well, it's, it's interesting because we're, we're the outlier because we've always used oral and we admit we're the outlier. Um, you know, that being the case, I look at it again as, you know, log logistically, how does it fit into your practice? Um, if oral treatments are difficult, because you're dependent on somebody outside to provide the medication and the patient to bring it or take it before they come in. Uh, you might say, gee, IV is you know, our choice because we see it administered and it's, you know, it's there. Uh, we have confidence. On the other hand, if you can reliably prescribe uh, and get the patient the medications orally, you know, it, it should work just as well. I'm assuming that the efficacies are going to be the same. So that being the case, it becomes a practice decision is what fits logistically into what they do in my eyes. Yeah, I think um, for practices that are designed to deliver the IV antiemetics, that's how our practice has been done 
over a long period of time. This will fit in beautifully. We'll be a substitution. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have a new agent which has long, less uh, interactions and also has a long half-life mm -hmm. and long uh, exposure so that you don't have to give it again. And so it will fit in very nicely for us and there may be less uh, storage fees associated with it as well. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be ideal for the multi-day regimens, most of which just happen to have cisplatin in them. So um, for oh, across disease sites, I think that'll be you know an ideal option for a day one management of a multi-day regimen. I also think for the hematologic malignancies where we are worried about all the drug-drug interactions and mucositis, I think it has a really nice niche there. Yeah, I, I agree with all of you. I think Howard, you said you're the outlier, you're living utopia. So for those, of, for those of us that, you know, are not able to facilitate oral treatments, you know, this is, this is going to be a, a nice addition.